Um, so um, I, I should say, well, my great interests are really making uh, glycoconjugates using enzymatic methods. But uh, over the last 10 years, we've been become very interested in analytics, um, in particular given that uh, for our sort of enzymatic reactions, we needed analytical techniques. And there didn't seem to be sort of very generic analytical uh, techniques around. And we had a particular problems, which I'm going to be talk about. Uh, and that made us think a little bit about the fact that there is still no generic carbohydrate sequencing methods. You know, obviously, as you all know, we can sequence peptides. And proteins, we can sequence DNA, of course, but for carbohydrates, we need these very, you know, specific sequencing methods, which we've already heard about, uh, uh, and, and, and they're fantastic, but they tend to be a little bit specific for natural uh, glycoconjugates and for particular classes. So we were quite interested in developing more generic classes, and, and that's what I'll, I'll be talking about today. And I should say this is a collaboration with my mass spectrometry colleagues who I was going to mention. So what has really sort of frustrated me as a chemist is that when we do sort of carbohydrate sequencing, in particular of complex uh, glycoconjugate, uh, you know, we, we, we do get a sort of picture of it, but it's still not particularly sharp in chemical terms. Uh, if you look at, I should, I should, just, I, I do this. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry, I just remembered. Um, so it's not particularly sharp in chemical terms. Uh, you know, there are always ambiguities, uh, and we've already seen this beautiful work today, and there are always sort of brackets, and you don't quite know on which arm the salic acid is, uh, and it gets worse when you don't really have a good understanding of the biosynthetic pathways. Um, so um, I had a very um, talented colleague, uh, Claire Ayers, who was a mass spectrometrist, uh, and uh, we started to think about how we could develop uh, techniques that could address this problem um, about 10 years ago. Um, and what has attracted us very much is this whole uh, shotgun sequencing approach, which is generally used in DNA um, and proteins. Um, and really what you do is you don't uh, sequence the whole glycoconjugate, you sort of fragment it. And of course, there are fantastic fragmentation methods available for nucleic acids. Um, and then you sequence the fragments and determine the fragments with high accuracy. Uh, and then you somehow really assemble these again, and you need computational method uh, to deconvolute it. I think the attraction about this method is not only that you can get full sequence determination, which I have to admit, you know, in carbohydrates is challenging, but you can actually look for certain motifs. Uh, and very often, in, I think, in carbohydrates, in glycoconjugates, we want to look for certain motifs and see whether they are there or not. Uh, and, and that's sort of a lot of the problems we had. Uh, we're really concerned with these motifs because all you then, then had to do is fragment it and then find you know, that particular motif in your mixture and then really determine the sequence of that. And that's what I'll be talking about today, really, really looking for motifs using this fragment-based approach. And when I talk about sort of sharpening up our sequencing, I'm obviously talking about full determination of all the stereochemistries. You know, which hexose do you have? Which linkage do you have? What is the connectivity? Is it alpha and beta? And so on. And ideally, we want to do this de novo, not uh, having, you know, all this uh, to determine all the biosynthetic pathways and so on, having this back, back, background no uh, knowledge. Um, now, in terms of fragmentation of carbohydrates, we unfortunately don't have restriction enzymes so much. We have some, but we have got obviously PNGAs. But as you all know, that's more difficult for other glycoconjugates. But we have got this fantastic method of fragmenting uh, carb carbohydrates uh, into fairly defined fragments, uh, all developed by, uh, for example, Doman and Costello. I think that's really the classic work in this area. So we know quite a lot about fragmentations of carbohydrates in the gas phase. Uh, and we're getting very defined fragments, and we're all, all using, uh, using these fragments for structure determination. So when you do use a fragment-based approach, we thought, well, can we do this all using mass spectrometry and using these sort of fragmentation methods which, which, which are already there for mass spectrometry, generating these sort of uh, fragments? And uh, I, think, I don't think I've explained it very much, but just to say that you get these B and C fragments, which are fragments that are either way of the glycogen glycosidic linkage, and you can also get, we've heard about this already, these cross-ring fragment fragmentations. But it's particularly the uh, link, uh, cleavage of the glycosidic linkages we were uh, in, interested in. So that, that the protocol to sequence a carbohydrate in analyte would just look like this. 
you would uh, have, a, have some sort of analyte. Uh, so this is maybe an unglycan structure. So this would not be necessarily labeled, could be labeled, but not necessarily. Then you do just di dissociations in your mass spectrometer using various dissociation methods into fragments. And these could be smaller fragments or even monosaccharides using the uh, sort of Damon, Damon Costello uh, type of uh, um, fragmentation patterns. Um, and then you could determine the mass spectrum. And of course, if you get M over Z values, that doesn't give you the full information of these fragments, but it's a very useful method. So mass spectrometry is probably, you know, we've been hearing so much about it at this meeting, is probably the best method to deal with complexity, sensitivity, uh, uh, and so on. But it doesn't obviously tell us anything about the three-dimensional structure. So you can link this to HPLC and LC and so on and compare it to standards, but it would be very nice if you could link the mass spectrometry in the gas phase with other orthogonal methods. And we've already heard about iron mobility, and iron mobility is something my colleague, Air Claire, suggested 10 years ago. So we really started to look into, can we combine mass spectrometry with iron mobility uh, spectrometry? And iron mobility tells you something about the shape. You still need, need, a fra need uh, standards, but you know, they're very, very well-defined well um, uh, uh, measurements. Uh, and then, actually, we had colleagues joining us, Isabel Compagnon and Kevin Pagel and so on, and they've now managed to do IR as well in line uh, as a hyphenated method with mass spectrometry. So really, what we want to do is get three-dimensional information on, on, on these fragments uh, uh, using these methods. And the reason we're particularly interested in fragmentation for this approach is that if you do iron mobility uh, mass spectrometry on the top compound here, the iron mobility requires you to compare the measurement with a standard. It's a bit sort of like LC. I explained a little bit more about that. Uh, and, and so for every analyte, you need a standard at some point. So you need a huge database of, of standards. But if you go to the fragments, the number of standards you need is, is reduced. So if you just think about N-glycans, you know, a lot of these diverse N-glycans share the same sub substructures. So you, you really reduce your uh, need for databases, uh, numbers of samples in the database, as you go down to, to smaller fragments. So the question is, you know, how does this approach work? And I should say, in the last 10 years, I think this has been more and more accepted, and not only our group, but other groups as well, have used this sort of uh, approach of determining structures of uh, uh, glycoconjugates. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about uh, iron mobility, just a quick, quick uh, couple of slides to, just to explain it. So it's a gas phase technique, so it can be used in line with mass spectra. So you just isolate an iron by M over Z value. So that's also a nice separation technique for this further analysis. And you just put it through this drift tube. You don't, don't, don't always get a sharp peak, uh, because what we are measuring here is really what is called uh, the um, CCS value. And uh, you can think about the CCS value as uh, putting the iron into sort of a, a sphere, and the radius of the sphere is related to the CCS value. And actually, it's a very, very important reproducible uh, physical parameter. It depends a bit on the drift gas you're using in, 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 your, uh, in your iron mobility uh, tube. But of course, these are very flexible molecules. They have different conformations. So very often with these glycans, in particular as you go to larger glycans, you get fingerprints. You don't necessarily get just uh, one peak. Um, the instrument is off the shelf, and in fact, that became available when we were starting, so that really s spurned us to do this. So this is an instrument from Waters, but we've heard about it, another instrument a minute ago. So it's basically like your normal mass spectrometer, just that in the middle you have this iron mobility tube, and you can just integrate the iron mobility measurements with your uh, fragmentation and M over Z value. And so, so this is all really off the shelf, and as I said, Claire Ayers and Perdi Tabaran are my colleagues uh, you know, run this instrument. Uh, because it is sort of basically an electrophoresis chromatography technique, the resolution you get depends on the length of the tube. And obviously you're, it's fixed in this instrument. Uh, but people have realized that this is a very useful technique and have tried to increase the resolution. So there's now another instrument on the market, a circular version, where you basically have the as ions around a circle. And that obviously dramatically increases your uh, drift tube uh, length and that also increases your resolution. So the data I'm showing you is on the left-hand instrument. Some of the re resolution is not particularly 
uh, impressive perhaps, but it's very reproducible. But as I said, just to point to the fact that there are you know, better instruments uh, now available. So as I said, we got into some applications we used. So we got into this because we were looking for a glycosyl transferase, is one of the mucin ones, core mucin ones, which normally uh, transfers galnac onto a peptide. Uh, uh, it's a T2, the T2 mucin transferase. And we found that in vitro, it was also transferring glycnac. At, at different KM values, but it was also doing that. And that seemed quite an interesting finding. Uh, and, uh, you know, we wanted to publish that. And the problem was, it was very difficult to prove that we had indeed transferred glycnac onto these, these different peptide substrates which we were using. If you think about it, an analytical technique that could distinguish between glitnac and galnac is, is, is on peptides is quite challenging. You really have to get sort of into NMR uh, or into uh, using LC methods with standards and so on, and that's really, really uh, challenging. Um, the reason why we needed think, thought we needed to show this is because there's an epimerase which is very abundant, and we were wondering, you know, we were worried that we couldn't publish this because people would argue, well, you just use there's an epimerase there, and and you're transferring your your galnac and not your glycnac. So, so that sort of so this they realize that it's really difficult to analyze sort of structures like this, in particular if they're unnatural structures like the one uh, we were uh, we were making. Uh, but also, you know, there are lots of glycoconjugates where we don't the pathways, the biosynthetic pathways, don't help us very much. And one project I won't talk much about is we uh, was on on metabolites. So there are a lot of plant metabolites which have various mono, di, tri, glucosides in different linkages. You know, they're incredibly difficult to to, to analyze. And uh, we had a very nice paper with Bill Gamellas and plant biologists using this sort uh, of fragment-based approach where we were able to assign the structure of these of these plant analytes. But I won't talk very much about it uh, today. Uh, because this is more sort of a glycomics uh, uh, audience. So just to show you the data, so you can actually do ion mobility on the glycopeptides, and we were making them uh, in vitro, you know, by adding either UDP galactose or UDP glucose, and we could actually show by ion mobility, and you could see the top trace there, that we get different traces. You know, the red trace is different from the blue trace, so the two peptides were different, which gives us some confidence that it was already, you know, that these were different. But of course, we, we we need to compare this to authentic standards. We would have had to make these chemically, which would have been very, very tedious. Um, and, and that's why we started to think about a fragment-based approach. So the question is, if you fragment this peptide, so with chemical ionization, for example, so you do this in the mass spectrometer, uh, you generate your ions, your oxonium ions here. And the question was, could you then, after fragmentation, do ion mobility and separate these two ions? Uh, and that would be obviously a much more universal method because you could use this for any glycopeptide. It's independent of the sequence. And to our surprise, the, so the separation, as I said before, is not brilliant on this instrument for these two, but they're really, really similar. And this was extremely reproducible. And it allowed us really to take any glycopeptide that had either galnac or glycnac and tell which one was which independent of having any glycopeptide standards. The only sta uh, standard we need here is a, a glycoside that's either got galnac or, or glycnac, and it could be any, any uh, of these glycosides. So really, uh, sort of a proof of principle that, that, that really helped us to sort of characterize these products. We also then, as, again, as proof of principle, applied this to N-glycans. Obviously, there we know what the structures are. And just to show that you know, when you do this, these fragments, independent on where they come from, from which analyte they come, in the gas phase, they will always have the same CCS value. So for example, if you generate fragments from this N-glycan on the top, you can either make the sort of larger fragments or the monosaccharides and compare them to fragments that come from standard, smaller standard sub substructures. They line up absolutely uh, perfectly. And uh, you, know, you can then do a sort of thought experiment and saying, OK, by uh, knowing all the CCS values of these small molecular weight substructure standards, I can actually then deduce uh, the full structure. So I only need, I only need fragment standards. Uh, as I said, emphasizing this point, you need a much smaller database of standards uh, uh, for this fragment-based approach. 
One thing we were a bit worried about is cleaving the glycosidic linkage because surely you would actually lose your information on alpha, beta, anomericity. Uh, and if you wanted to really sequence carbohydrates, you have to determine whether things are alpha uh, or beta. Uh, and uh, of course, mass spectrometry doesn't do that terribly well. There are some methods looking at sort of different heights of peaks, but generally, mass spectrometry is not very good. So if you have alpha, uh, the diglucoside, one, two diglucosides, alpha or beta, they give you the same mass spectrum. Uh, you know, that's sort of as expected. Uh, so the question is, what about when we then combine this with iron mobility? And to our surprise, there seemed to be a really uh, reproducible anomeric memory effect. So depending on whether uh, the gl glucose ion comes from an alpha or beta linkage, you get uh, addition, an additional peak. So this additional peak, uh, can you yeah, see this here, is this, is this dark peak here. As I said, it's small but really reproducible. Uh, and the, uh, irrespective on what your linkage is, so we measured all the diglucosides, with all the alpha and beta ones with different regions activity, this pattern that you always get on the alpha glucoside, this extra peak held. So that means there's this memory effect. So you can use this method also to talk uh, to, to determine the glycosidic linkage, uh, which, which we felt was a really important uh, step forward. I should say we've also taken the fragments which you generated and looked at them by IR. And by IR, they also look very different. So there's really the alpha and the beta anomers generate different uh, fragments under our measuring conditions. And that really means that we can really determine everything sort of de novo on a glycoconjugates in principle. Obviously, we haven't shown that for every structure, but we have shown examples of several structures where this, is, this holds. So we can distinguish between galactose and glucose, between alpha and beta linkages, and of course, through the cross ions, we have already seen some beautiful work there, you can, you can distinguish which what the connectivity is. And really, in principle, you know, this method allows you to fully assign uh, carbohydrates. But as I said, we have really used it mainly to look at particular isomeric uh, motifs. And uh, just if I just show you quickly a few examples. Um, so, for example, you might want to know about a certain motifs on an antibody or glyco, uh, glycoprotein. And uh, you're all familiar with, uh, with this slide here, so I don't have to go through that. Uh, and, and just to show you one example, um, we had a project a few years ago um, where we wanted to develop a alpha-2,6 uh, salidase. Uh, salidase that was selected for alpha-2,6 linkages, over 2,3 six linkages. To our surprise in the literature, there are salidases that cleave 2,3. Salidases cleave both 2, 3, and 2, 6, but 2, 6 selective salidases, uh, you know, ha hadn't been uh, reported. And we developed this enzyme. It's, uh, we call it a pseudosalidase. It was actually a, a transferase that we used in reverse. Um, and uh, what we hoped that this enzyme would do, even in the context of a complex glycoprotein, really only cleaves the 2, 6 linkages. But we somehow had to prove that. And as you know, if you sort of helic, you can't really distinguish terribly well between alpha and beta, and you've also got a broad mixture. So what we did is we used this fragment-based approach, and in particular we used, for, out of this forest of M over Z peaks, we isolated this B3 ion, which you can see here, which is that trisaccharide that crucially contains the 2, 3, or 2, 6 uh, linkage, uh, which we were interested in. And if you do that on fetuin, which contains both, so that's the second here, the second panel here, you see clearly two peaks uh, for the sala lactose. And we assigned them as alpha and beta, and we could assign the left-hand one as a 2,6, the yellow one as a 2,6, uh, because we had a standard that we knew only contained the 2,6 uh, ranks. So then uh, if you treat this with an uh, enzyme called NAN-B, which is a 2,3 salidase, you get the yellow because you cleave the 2,3. Uh, 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 um, and with our pseudosalidase, you can see you get the other peak. So, so in this very complex protein context, we could actually show with this method that we get really good selectivity for the 2,6 uh, sardic acid linkage.
We've also collaborated, tried to introduce this method into other workflows, and you all know the beautiful work Pauline Rudd's been doing, and she has this lab in Singapore, and I was very lucky to have a joint student with them, uh, A-star Manchester student at, um, um, at Pallister, who was a really very talented student, so this is him in, in Singapore, and we published some really nice papers adding iron mobility to the HILIC uh, protocol. Um, so Alistair's project was uh, a glycosylation of alpha antitrypsin. So alpha antitrypsin is a biopharmaceutical. Uh, uh, silylation is extremely important. Uh, from their fermentation procedures, that didn't get very high silylation. You can see here the silylated form has a circulatory half-life of five days, desilylated of only five minutes. So really, we wanted to increase the silylation by uh, doing, uh, doing uh, silylation using silyl transferases. So that was sort of his, his, his starter uh, project. Um, and he did that with a bacterial silyl transferase, which we could express in E. coli. It's quite a cheap process, really. Uh, CMP nana, we can uh, regenerate, again, using bacterial regeneration enzymes. So that worked really quite well. Uh, but because, you know, they, they wanted to analyze the glycans, uh, he did a full hillic analysis uh, on, 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 these, on, the, on the product. Um, and to his surprise, he found a structure that seemed to have be over -silylated. So when he looked at that terminal silyl lactose using sort of similar approaches uh, I've, I've shown before, he clearly found that there was a motif that had the sort of the silyl lactose, and the silyl lactose had a further silylation. And this was, uh, this, this is a, um, a, um, uh, an extracted iron chromatogram on different glycosylation sites, and you know, he saw this structure clearly on different glycosylation sites. So there seemed to have been some over uh, happening, and we wanted to know which one that was. And you can imagine that's quite difficult to determine on something like complex like a, 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 a glycoprotein. So we had sort of uh, hypotheses that it could be one of those three structures, uh, the left-hand one, uh, I think we've just seen this uh, previously, but it didn't really fit with the substrate specificity of our enzyme, but it could be that one that has this sort of internal extra silylation. Uh, it could be a disilylation, but then you needed to aid silyl transferase, so that was also a little bit unlikely that our enzyme would do that. Um, and then we found in the literature one report of a structure, only a free oligosaccharide, which had this interesting 2, 3, plus 2, 6 uh, silylation. And so we were wondering which one of those what it was. And uh, after quite a long story, uh, he could show that by this, with this iron mobility fragmentation approach, using a standard of, uh, of all of these, that the best fit was clearly with this di unusual disilylated structure. So the enzyme was putting both a 2,3 and a 2,6 salic acid uh, onto this terminal galactose, which is obviously uh, you know, very relevant when you remodel glycans that you know exactly uh, what you have in your, in, in your mixtures. They then extended this to sort of address some long-standing issues of heterogeneity with these hillic profiles. I mean, we've seen a lot of these hillic profiles. I think Pauline has really uh, pioneered these. Uh, and really, there's still quite a lot of ambiguities. This goes back to this sort of sharpness of, of this image, as you all know. You know, if you, if you look at assignment of the peaks, you know, people don't know really which arm is glycosylated, which arm carries which glycan. As I said, do you have 2,6 or 2,3 silic acids on some of these? So there's still, despite the fact that you have so many peaks and you've got this sharpness, there's, there's still some ambiguity. It might not matter in every experiment. Maybe with high throughput experiment, it doesn't matter. But, you know, we should have methods to resolve this. And by taking these peaks and then sending them through an iron mobility, so basically sticking with their method, the hillic method, but just adding the iron mobility step to it in, in, in line, uh, they were managed to actually really separate a lot of these, uh, these isomers. Because it's a fragment-based approach, it doesn't really matter whether you do glycoproteomics or whether you use these labeling techniques, you know, because we're only looking at these fragments. Uh, it shouldn't really matter uh, where, where they originate from, and Ed did, did both, did it both, and, you know, really wanted to resolve these, these, these sort of isomers, you know, as I said, the, 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 the alpha um, one six and 3-arm, uh, you know, of, of the core, um, 
var various isomerizations. And really, he, he published a very extensive analytical chemistry paper just to show you just one set of data. Uh, for example, he wanted to know whether the galactose was on the three or the six arm here. Uh, so these two, these are two clearly isomeric fragments, which are difficult to separate uh, by hillock. Um, and by fragmentation, you could uh, look at fragments that are very diagnostic, depending on, you can see these tetrasaccharides really uh, uh, are different, depending on which arm, uh, you know, uh, they're on. Uh, obviously, you can ignore all the other M over Z fragments, so you send them through the iron mobility tube. And you can see, first of all, Regardless of whether you start with labeled glycans that have been PNGAs released or whether you start with glycopeptides, you really get very reproducibly exactly the same profiles. So you really, again, emphasizing this technique is really quite uh, reproducible. Uh, and then when he had the, uh, it, uh, it on the three arm, you could see he get very reproducibly this, this extra peak at two, three, four, again regardless of the underlight. So you can distinguish between those. And in this paper, there are many, many more exp uh, you know, experiments on other, on other uh, uh, isomers, which I uh, won't uh, talk about. And I just want to finish with the fact to say that other, other groups now using this. There's a very nice paper from, the, from Rebecca Miller and, and the Packel group where they did this for gags. So they, they wanted to just know whether in this very large gag there was that pentasaccharide or hexasaccharide sequence, whether it was there. Um, and by using uh, standards, you can see here in C, A, B, C, D, substandards, which are much more easy to access synthetically, uh, and then comparing the iron mobility fragments and so on, uh, they could actually assign the sequence uh, really unambiguously and show that that particular sequence was either there. So, so this, this approach doesn't only work for N-glycans and uh, metabolites, it also uh, works for GAGs. And I think it's a very, very nice method if you want to get very, very high resolution uh, of uh, structure determination, which in some cases might be, uh, might be important. So really, I think we have now two techniques, really. The top technique is perhaps more amenable if you want to do glycomics experiment. You label, you get the full fragments, and then you separate them uh, by uh, LC methods and so on and compare them to standards. So I think we've had a lot of very beautiful examples here. So uh, it requires really big databases. That's a sort of one, one problem and large number of standards. Uh, but, of course, the data are much more simple to interpret. Uh, Claire Ayers and Perdita Barron, Chris Gray and Ed Pallister have really been the PhD students in my group who have really pushed this. So I have to really thank them, thank my collaborators, uh, funders, and I thank you for your attention.